welcoming everybody to our last of the semester Chala. And it is my great pleasure to introduce Dr. Tanya Harmer, who is Professor of International History at the London School of Economics and Political Science. As many of you know, she's a specialist on the Cold War in Latin America, with particular interest in the international, transnational, and global dynamics of the period. She has written widely on Chile, in Chile's revolutionary process in the 1970s, the Cuban Revolution's influence in Latin America, counter-revolution, inter-American diplomacy, solidarity networks, and women and gender. She is the author of Allende's Chile and the Inter-American Cold War. And her latest monograph is titled uh, Beatriz Allende, A Revolutionary Life in Cold War Latin America, which uses the biographical lens to tell the story of Beatriz Allende and Chile's revolutionary left that came of age in the shadow of the Cuban Revolution. Professor Harma has also co-edited a book that just came out with Alberto Martin Alvarez. It is titled Towards a Global History of Latin America's Revolutionary Left and presents new research on the global reach of Latin American revolutionary movements during the height of the Cold War, mapping out the region's little known connections with Africa, Asia, Asia and Europe. Today, she will speak about her most recent work on Southern coal exiles from Chile and Uruguay who came to Cuba in the 70s and 80s. Welcome, Professor Harmer. Thank you very much um, for the invitation. Thank you for the very kind introduction, um, Jadviga, as well. It's uh, wonderful to be here. Um, and it's really privileged to be able to share and to receive feedback on what is really a very new and developing research project of mine. Um, it builds on my latest book on Beatriz Allende, who was an exile in Cuba, but it expands the lens, uh, the frame um, um, considerably to look um, at the kind of exile communities in Cuba more um, broadly. And as I said, it's it's early stage, so I'm, I'm really, really grateful um, to be here. Um, and to receive your criticisms, your comments and your questions uh, right as I get started with this project. Um, so as, as, as kind of the title of my project, of uh, the paper today suggests, um, I'm gonna be talking about Cuba as a site of refuge for exiles um, from the Southern Cone um, who were fleeing dictatorship um, and persecution in the 70s and 80s. Um, I'm going to share my screen. I've got a PowerPoint that I hope will um, will uh, enliven things a little um, on this December lunchtime for you, uh, December nighttime, very cold here in London. Um, but let me let me start by um, giving you a little bit of background. Um, and I think probably um, many of you will be familiar, but let me start by saying that from the beginning of the revolution, the beginning of the Cuban revolution, Fidel Castro had made it very, um, plain that Cuba would become uh, uh, would be a, a welcome uh, site of refuge uh, to Latin Americans who might need it. Um, to those who attended the Latin American Youth Congress in uh, July 1960, he proclaimed, "When you are persecuted," to these thousands who had uh, come to the island, uh, young Latin Americans, he said, "When you are persecuted here in Cuba, here are millions of brotherly arms waiting for you." You need to know that here in Cuba, you also have your homeland and that here in Cuba, the homes of the children of our people are also your homes. Just over a decade later, at the height of Latin America's Cold War, his promise was put to the test as thousands of exiles arrived on the island fleeing Southern Cone uh, dictatorships. This is not to say that Cuba received more Latin American exiles than other countries. In the case of Chilean exiles that I'm gonna be talking um, primarily about um, today, alongside Uruguayan exiles, the estimates, the estimates of those who spent time in Cuba range from about 3,000 to 5,000, although it's very hard to really get an accurate number of exactly how many Chileans lived in Cuba in the 70s and 80s. Um, Paola Pareja, Meni and Valentina Corto von Salias have written a short piece on uh, Uruguayan exile in Cuba, which has been incredibly helpful to me. Um, and 
have, you know, it's probably the most full, uh, fully, the fullest study of Uruguayan exile in Cuba to date. Um, and they calculate that about 1,200 Uruguayans found refuge um, on the island. Now, even if these are conservative estimates, in terms of South-South exile or ex exile destinations overall, um, they're far fewer numbers than those who made it to Venezuela, for example, or those um, who ended up in Mexico, the 10,000 Chileans, for example, who called Mexico um, their home. In terms of the Uruguayan exiles, um, Argentina and Brazil were obviously far more um, uh, uh, common destinations with 109,000 Uruguayans living in Argentina by the 1980s. Now, this also doesn't encompass the whole of the entirety of exile and migration during the 1970s and 80s. So we're talking about hundreds of thousands who left Chile, Uruguay, and also who left Brazil and Argentina um, during this period. So Cuba is not uh, a place of interest because it received the most exiles. But what I argue is exile in Cuba was nevertheless unique and it was particularly important, um, particularly for left-wing militants who were leaving Chile and Uruguay, who were leaving the Southern Cone. Because to be exiled on the island, either through choice um, or necessity, choice in terms of choosing to live exile in Cuba, not choice in terms of ex exile itself. Um, whether they were directed by party leaders, as many militants were, um, held political, ideological and strategic significance. For many, it meant the continuation of revolutionary projects, an opportunity conceived in theory at least, as the Uruguayan scholar Silvia Dutrenet puts it, to contribute to the revolution and prepare oneself militarily. To seek refuge in revolutionary Cuba was therefore not just to receive sanctuary from harm, it was also considered a means of maintaining a revolutionary identity, a fulfilling learned praxis with a view to working for a revolutionary future. This was true of institutionalized politics. However, as I'm going to try and explain, it was also in many cases more powerfully as a result of the constraints encountered uh, in Cuba to fulfill expectations, it was reflected in exiles' private and everyday lives. Um, at a moment when counter-revolutionary forces were advancing throughout Latin America, Cuba became, in the words of one observer, in close contact with exile groups at the time, quote, a base where they could sit down, discuss, meet, train, and heal, etc. Now, the work I've done so far on this project um, has drawn is, draw, is, is primarily drawing on oral histories um, with those who um, lived in exile in Cuba uh, during the 70s um, and 80s. Um, and I've primarily interviewed um, Chilean and Uruguayan left-wing militants who I'm going to be talking about um, today. And I'm going to be using their testimonies to try and sketch out and untangle what um, um, what it meant to live um, in exile in Cuba during these years. To date, I've interviewed um, around 30 former exiles um, and their children. I've interviewed men and women, as well as those from different political parties and tendencies. And for those perhaps less familiar with the Chilean and Uruguayan kind of political scene, um, this spanned from the revolutionary left, what you might call kind of the, yeah, the those kind of more um, uh, sympathetic to the Cuban, um, uh, um, revolutionary strategies of armed struggle, um, guerrilla insurgencies, the MIR from Chile, the movement of the revolutionary left, and in Uruguay, the MLNT, or the Tupamaros, as they were known, the Movimiento de Liberación Nacional Tupamaro. Um, and on the other side, you've got um, the, the more Soviet-aligned communist parties, the Communist Party of Chile, the Communist Party of Uruguay, but also you've got the Socialist Party um, of Chile um, as well, that um, was one of many of, uh, parties on the Chilean left, um, a very complex and fractured kind of uh, left-wing scene there. But um, on the Chilean side and on the Uruguayan side, um, those of all these different tendencies, you know, you had representatives um, in exile in Cuba during this period. So what I'm going to talk about today is the roots and of the that led exiles to Cuba, so how they got there. Um, um, I'm going to talk about the reception and the refuge that they received on the island. I want to talk a little bit about the reality of exile, um, the reality in, in this respect versus the expectations that they had. 
um, what revolutionary life was like. Um, and then um, I'd like to end up by talking about the remembering of exile. So memory of exile as well, which I hope I expect to become a much bigger part, perhaps, or a central part of this project. In choosing to compare and contrast the different communities of exiles in Cuba, um, I also um, intend or want something that has been revealed to me by speaking to people from different tendencies has been the very varied left wing experiences or experiences of left wing militants and their families um, on the island, um, showing that really the exile experience depended as it did elsewhere on political affiliation, on conceptualization of revolution and of status within um, the revolutionary parties. Um, now, um, which in turn, I'd say, shows the varieties of revolutionary identities at the height of Latin America's Cold War. We kind of think Cuba left, but obviously the, the exile experience shows how complex and diverse this um, actual left was um, within the Cold War struggle. Um, so let me talk, turn first to talk about roots um, then. Um, and as you'll see, um, or hopefully you'll be able to see um, on your screen there, um, uh, there were many different routes that Chilean and Uruguayan left-wing militants took um, to exile. And as you'll see from the different examples that I've put up, the four different examples, this the routes to Cuba very often led via other countries um, first, um, uh, through third countries or even through fourth countries in some cases. Um, um, and very often these uh, these routes were through with the support of Cuban embassies um, or um, instructions under instructions of political parties. Um, and I haven't got time to kind of flesh out all of these routes in detail, but let me talk about the first one um, first, <laughs> as is unsurprising, really. Um, so in about 1971, 1972, um, members of the Tupamaros particularly group in Uruguay started um, seeking exile in Chile. Um, at the time, Chile was, um, under, had, was um, under the government of the Unidad Popular, Allende was president, um, uh, revolutionary process was um, taking place there. So it seemed a logical place um, to seek exile and Chile provided a relatively um, kind of welcoming atmosphere for Uruguayans, uh, Tupamaros, who were fleeing a kind of clampdown and repression, which really started um, to become very serious for Tupamaros from 1972 onwards. And at a breakaway meeting in Viña del Mar on the coast in Chile, a group of Tupamaro leaders reached uh, a conclusion that the recent defeats in Uruguay had been the result of and this is how they talked about it at the time, petty bourgeois tendencies in the organization that militants had to live as workers and study Marxist-Leninist theory so as to transform the party for future phase of armed struggle. In agreement between the leadership and the Cuban revolutionary regime, then um, Tupamaro started organizing the transfer of militants in Chile um, to Cuba on regular flights to remedy um, this um, uh, this problem um, with the aim of um, um, organizing training programs um, under a secret agreement um, and also with the knowledge, as far as I understand it, with the Chilean authorities as well, who let them leave with false identities. The expectation by 1973 that there would be a coup in Chile also precipitated and accelerated these moves to Cuba. So as safety became increasingly concerning in Chile, the move to Cuba was um, accelerated as well. Then of course came the coup um, on 11th of September, 1973 in Chile. And this is where we get to the second route of Chileans and Uruguayans um, to um, Cuba. Um, so really from Chile, um, exile happened in, in, in a number of, in, in most cases by chance, um, you know, in, in terms of which embassies and which routes might be possible to get out of the country um, in, in the immediate aftermath of the coup. Um, the, the fact that the junta immediately um, broke relations with Cuba meant that the, the Cuban embassy ceased to, to be able to operate um, in, in offering asylum directly and direct flights and routes between Chile and Cuba were canceled. 
Um, the Swedish ambassador took over the interests of the Cuban embassy, however, um, and played a pivotal role in helping Uruguayans um, uh, to, to, to leave the country, um, and many actually rerouted to Sweden. Now, I've got a very uncomfortable arrow just kind of going off the page here, um, but that's meant to represent those who went to Sweden. But there were also uh, Uruguayans and Chileans um, who sought refuge um, in other European embassies, um, who went to Italy, to Germany, um, some went to England, um, and from there, they managed to travel to Cuba. So it, they went first to Europe um, and then to Cuba. Um, now this happened um, part, sometimes um, through direct petitions to the Cuban embassies um, that were in Europe, but also in some cases, in the case of the Tupamaros, um, it also happened under instructions or under requests to the party leadership that they be transferred to Cuba to take part in this training program that I mentioned that was already in existence before 1973. Um, the third um, route really was Argentina. Um, Argentina um, had become a refuge for thousands of Chileans and Uruguayan exiles. Um, from 72 for Uruguay um, and then after 1973. But with security services and death squads moving against the left um, from 1974, 75 in Argentina, and then obviously um, very decisively when the coup hit in 1976, Argentina became a, a very uncomfortable um, and unsafe um, location for um, exiles um, to reside. Um, th those I interviewed told of getting in increasingly scared, increasingly concerned. Um, some went to the Cuban embassy, which there was one in Argentina and asked to be able to um, move and um, relocate to Cuba and some were you know, granted that asylum. Um, others were instructed by the party leadership that they had to leave Argentina and some were offered a choice and, and chose to go to Cuba rather than East um, Europe. Um, essentially by 1976, Argentina was considered a quote trap um, and in the context of targeted repression of Communist Party members from Uruguay, particularly who had increasingly been um, uh, targeted uh, after the coup there in 1973, um, uh, militants started um, uh, uh, traveling um, to Cuba. There was a, a, an agreement between this party of Uruguay and Cuba to transfer militants stuck in Argentina uh, to the island. According to Pareyang Corto, four flights carrying Communist Party militants from Uruguay, Uruguayan Communist Party militants, left Buenos Aires in 1976, carrying around 150 passengers each, um, with safe passage provided by the Red Cross, the UNHCR, um, the Intergovernmental Committee for European Migrations, and the Catholic Commission. Um, there are also accounts of Uruguayan communist um, militants um, going to Mexico um, at this moment in 1976 and from there find, finding refuge or, or safe passage um, to Cuba. So, I mean, it's, this is a complex picture already um, and it's only um, scratching the surface. There were many other routes, I'm, I'm sure. But, but there were, I know there were routes via Panama, there were routes via Peru. Um, but essentially going to Cuba was not a direct um, point of exile. It often entailed going through other countries first. Recalling their arrival in Cuba, um, and here we have a picture of uh, the first exile really to arrive in Cuba from Chile, Beatriz Allende, who arrived on the 13th of September, 1973. Um, but recalling their arrival in Cuba, former exiles have spoken to me of a range of emotions um, and uh, um, expectations, and and I should and I use the word emotions quite um, uh, consciously and and specifically because those who did speak to me very often struggled to hold back tears as they recounted that moment of arrival. Um, they spoke of protection, the sense that Cuba was um, for them was seen as a kind of somewhere that would protect them, um, the island would protect them, um, but also of relief. Um, particularly those who had traveled from one country to the other, perhaps from Chile to Argentina, and then faced repression in both countries or from Uruguay to Chile um, uh, and, and been there for the coup. Um, Rita, a Uruguayan, um, told me, the anguish left me. I mean, it was amazing. No one was chasing me anymore. They weren't going to kill me. There was a relief because no one was going to kill us. Um, there was also excitement, um, or should I say anticipation, at arriving where somewhere where so many had dreamed of, um, particularly 
um, of a younger generation that had grown up in the, in the kind of shadow of the Cuban revolution. So there was expectation and anticipation, excitement as to what life on the island would be like. And, and the vast majority had never been to Cuba before. And, and with it came expectation. So an expectation of um, being somewhere where that would help them to fulfill uh, revolutionary um, commitments or that would allow them to contribute to the fight against the dictatorship back in the Southern Cone. And I'll give you a couple more quotes from those who I interviewed. Um, Danielle told me Cuba was a kind of guide that we had of what we wanted for our country society, a radical change in the style of Cuba. We fully trusted that we would feel identification there. And well, Cuba also identified with our struggle. I wanted to go back to Uruguay, Fernando told me, I wanted to prepare myself politically, militarily to come back. That was my objective. In fact, I never said that I had gone to, into exile. I never admitted that. And he was one of those who was uh, Tupamaro who would go and join one of these training camps, which, was always, which were always seen as a kind of more transitory kind of uh, um, stage. So let me then talk about um, refuge and uh, kind of what, what happened when they arrived. Um, and one of the things that I've found that has been so striking is, and you know, it was known before, but which is something that I've kind of learned um, even more so from the, these oral histories that I've conducted is that the refuge that the Cubans offered exiles depended to a large extent on the political affiliation, the position of, in left-wing organizations and the individual circumstances of each exile. The various configurations of left-wing groups embedded in Latin America's Cold War struggle or its varied paths to revolution, as historical protagonists understood it at the time, mattered enormously in conditioning how refugees were treated, the autonomy they had, and the life in exile they were able to build in Cuba. Indeed, rather than try to forge bridges between the different groups, the Cuban revolutionary state with its own shifting approaches to ideological strategy and alignment taking place precisely in the mid 1970s appeared to have juggled varying policies towards different factions rather than approaching the exiles in any kind of unified and systematic way. So what I'm going to do now um, is talk through kind of some of the different types of refuge that different types of exiles um, received. And the first place to start is with these Tupamaros. I've put MLNT, but this is the acronym for the Tupamaros, um, who until 1976 had a very particular experience on the island. Um, they were housed in um, what were known as colonias, um, colonies of about 30 to 50 people, um, mostly young people between 17 and 30 um, years old. Now these colonies, I've put seven question mark in total. Um, because I don't think, it, I, it's very hard to get, get precise. This is from testimonies from published memoirs, um, what I've been able to find out. Um, was spread in different locations around the island. Um, and um, altogether, it was thought there were about 500 people in these colonies, which is why there's another question mark, because the maths don't quite add up if you, if you do the sums really here. But most people talk about 500, and they talk about seven colonies spread out um, around um, different locations, um, all pre-arranged by the Tupamaro leadership and the Cuban authorities. Um, and within them, exiles received food and supplies, which were brought to them directly from what someone called, told me, what, industrial kitchens in thermos containers. And coordinating these meals were the ministry, was the Ministry of Interior, or MININT, as I put up on the slide. Um, and more specifically within it, um, the office, that was responsible for Cuba's revolutionary policies in Latin America, what would later become the Department of the Americas under Manuel Pinero's direction within it. One rural colony also received two cows so that the children living there had regular fresh milk supplies um, and Tupamaros had to learn to milk them um, to be able to provide the milk. Um, conditions varied depending on the colonies, but whether in large houses or big reconfigured warehouses or sheds, militants were generally divided into dormitories for men and women with bunk beds, although some offered a few rooms for couples that were often rotated. Um, in at least one colony, however, members worked out there were their own makeshift, makeshift living arrangements, sometimes sleeping in buildings where they were helping with construction at the time. In another that was specifically for families with children arriving after 73, families had a room each in a large house. 
The colonies were designed to provide inhabitants with physical training, which is why you see construction, maintenance, factory work. Um, this was the proletarian working environment um, that would accompany them also, which would also be accompanied with political education often taking place in the evenings. All of these were deemed essential for a future return to Uruguay and a regeneration of the Tupamaros revolutionary struggle in accordance with those decisions made in, in the meeting in Chile that I discussed. One of the specificities of the Colonia's Colonia experiment was the way in which those involved viewed themselves. As I've indicated already, um, instead of exiles, they regarded themselves as militants in training, fulfilling a revolutionary mission that would lead them back um, home. That, that This wasn't a place of refuge, but rather a place of transit. Um, because this was a secret agreement between the Cuban authorities and the Tupamaros, um, all uh, those in the colonias assumed false identities um, and were as Argentines or Ecuadorians or Latin American solidarity brigades, which were working on different construction projects um, uh, nearby where they were living. Many threw themselves into the experience, which as one participant remembered, they envisaged from the outset as a sort of three month internship. Um, and I've got some quotes here from those who were part of the colonies um, experiment. We did everything with the enthusiasm that we were doing this well, that we were helping a country that was helping us, Olga told me. Fernando told me the work was a question of training. It was also to give back to some extent the solidarity that Cuba gave us. In fact, there was a very, how would you call it, Spartan behavior perhaps, in a sense that really, it was not that we worked to fulfill some obligation, but that we worked with a desire to do the best possible and to learn and to do the best we could. There were others, um, who have since been far more critical of the experience of the colonies. Um, they talked about, they have talked about isolation of separation from Cuban society, of not being able to um, maintain their proper identities, even from those who were also within the colonies, um, of excessive compartmentalization, which one person who uh, was there preferred to remain anonymous, regarded as cruel even um, when it came to actually separating families who were well, family members who were, were on the island but were, were not meant to know that they were on the island. Um, Fernando Butasoni, a famous Uruguayan uh, author, um, uh, told uh, Pareja and Corto, we lived almost on the margins. Um, sorry, my screen is, I can't see the quote actually. We lived almost on the margins, much more vinculated, vinculated to the political life of our organization. We lived in a kind of ghetto, a sect. We also had our own codes, our own rights, our own scale of values that was very different from the Cubans and our own aesthetic, which was very different from the Cuban one. We were in a kind of very long standby waiting to know what was going to, was happening in Uruguay. The Chileans who arrived after 1973, and I'm going to move on now to talk about another group, um, arrived in very different circumstances, and, and they did so in a much more open and public, um, uh, a public way. Uh, there was enormous mobilization in Cuba against the coup in Chile and an outpouring of support for the Chileans who arrived on the island. So there was no question of kind of assuming uh, different identities or, or kind of um, being separated from Cuban society to the conscience, the, the, to the country, the Cuban society kind of embraced many of those who arrived. Um, the Chileans who arrived after 1973 um, generally moved into hotels or resorts and later into fully furnished apartments. Um, um, and, in, um, and in keeping with an agreement that Fidel announced, but was very much remembered um, by those I spoke to as coming from the people, um, Chileans were offered one apartment block, one apartment um, in every new block that was being constructed. Um, um, by micro brigades in Havana surrounding districts. And this is the famous Alamar kind of complex um, outside, of, outside of Havana, but um, particularly with new apartment blocks that were built, but also with existing apartment blocks, there was a donation out of solidarity of one apartment to um, new exiles arriving in, um, in Cuba. Um, mostly these were located in the outskirts or, or surrounding areas of Havana, but Chileans also um, were relocated throughout Cuba, um, some with reluctance, some more willingly. And exiles told me that, or former exiles told me that this 
this had a lot to do with kind of uh, where they were had been living in Chile before. Like if they were used to being in Santiago, the idea of leaving Havana was much more kind of problematic than um, if they had kind of grown up in southern rural areas of Chile. Um, there were groups that had their own apartment blocks, and this was um, Mirista women who arrived in Cuba, particularly widows or partners of Mirista men who had either died or who were fighting in um, Chile, were uh, given a whole um, block of apartments um, in Alamar. Um, El Edificio de los Chilenos, the, build, the Chilean building, um, which was known as D-DOS, um, T, sorry, I'm doing Spanish, Spanglish here, D2. Um, but there was also another building that was given to the mayor, um, which came to form the Proyecto de Hogares, or the a new kind of house for um, children and adoptive parents that looked after the children of those who were involved in the operation of return, or the return operation at the end of the 70s and the 80s, of when the mayor um, smuggled um, militants back into uh, Chile to try and um, overthrow the dictatorship. Another group then were the those who had been in the colonies until 1976. And what happened was, to the surprise of many of the Tupamaro militants watching the first Communist Party Congress live, they heard Fidel Castro underlining a new allegiance to the Soviet Union and distancing himself decisively from support for guerrilla insurgencies and armed resistance in Latin America. And it's effectively what happened is the agreement between the Tupamaros and the Cuban government stopped in 1975-76 and all those who were in the colonies were offered the choice to leave or to um, to stay. Um, to leave to Europe um, was generally the route um, and about from what I can gather about half stayed and about half left. Um, for those who stayed about 250 um, they were then relocated around the island um, um, and they were also given fully furnished apartments, one apartment per block, but they were distributed far more sparsely around Cuba in groups of five or six families. So very often integrated far more into Cuban society and Cuban communities because there were smaller groups of them, um, some in Guantanamo, some in Holguin, some in Santa Clara, all over the island um, as well. And then you had the Communist Party, Uruguayan Communist Party members who arrived really after this agreement to in 1976 um, and similar to other groups they were similar to other groups experience but um, lived rather separately from um, the Tupamaros or um, and very often from the Chileans as well there was integration or sorry there was contact but they kind of tended to keep within their self-enclosed communities and um, relationships with each other um, as I've had it described to me the Communist Party of Uruguay, the community also had very strict security standards and standards to maintain um, whilst they were in Cuba. They did not regard exile as a break from the struggle um, and exposing their location in some countries in the case of having to return could put them in a situation of vulnerability. So a daughter of some Uruguayan Communist Party exiles told me that no photos could ever be taken of the family outside of the house because there was a fear that that might reveal in some way where they were. Um, um, and last but no means least, there were the leaders and the personalities who are not really the objects of my study, actually, because uh, I think what has been written has been written from the point of view of these kind of select leaders. And they were housed more in, a, in houses or quite plush apartments in Havana, in the, in the districts of Vedado, in Miramar and in Playa, um, the kind of plush areas of, or, of, of, of what, what were the kind of upper class areas of Havana prior to the revolution. So I'm sorry to kind of go through all of these quite detailed kind of descriptions, but I think actually mapping out these different communities has been a very big part of this initial stage of the research. Um, let me talk um, briefly around the reality of exile. I mean, when it came to revolution and party politics, um, Cuba offered the opportunity for survival of political parties, of institution building, of maintaining party offices, um, as it offered an opportunity as a, a rear guard, as a base um, from which to reorganize and, 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 and a platform um, to project and coordinate with other kind of um, party bases um, elsewhere um, in different parts of the world. Um, it also offered um, a location and support for solidarity uh, work. Um, solidarity work um, being um, with regards 
to, um, as I said, coordination, communication, a platform, logistical and financial help. And when I'm talking about logistical and financial help, I'm talking about travel, I'm talking about printing, I'm talking about offices, communication, but also um, uh, Cuban embassies and delegations from international forums working with um, exile communities to actually project um, and campaign against dictatorships back home. And of course, this received very high level support, um, or it, maybe not, of course, but in the case, certainly of the Chilean um, Solidarity Committee, it received um, top support from um, Fidel Castro, but also from the Department of the Americas. Um, but it also very much involved um, uh, the production of materials um, of information. And uh, I put the Chile Informativo up here, which was a bulletin that was pr um, um, printed initially in Cuba and then um, in Mexico and distributed throughout the Americas. But I've also got this wonderful picture of the um, Feria Internacional del Libro in 1976. And behind um, Enrique San Martín and Roberto Contreras, you'll see all the publications that are being produced on Chile at the time, which is quite um, a, a, a phenomenal. When it came to the other expectation, which was training, right? Uh, military training, revolutionary training, um, it was far less than expected is my sense uh, as a whole. And um, particularly in the initial phases when of exile, when the situation in the Southern Cone was uh, bleak, uh, dire, um, but more so in the late seventies um, and eighties, um, particularly when it came to particular returns like the operation Retur of return for the Mir, um, but certainly much less in the case of the Tupamaros who expected to train and then go back to Uruguay. Um, where you did have training and military training came very much more in the internationalist missions. And I've put up here a picture, a screenshot from a new documentary that um, Euro some Uruguayans are making um, related to the Uruguayan combatants who fought in the Sandinista revolution. And perhaps more is known about the Chileans who also fought in Nicaragua. But, Cuba became for some a bridge to revolutionary internationalism and operations um, elsewhere. Um, significantly also there was a, a an Uruguayan communist brigade who went to, Nica uh, who went to Angola um, and served under the auspices of the Cuban civil mission, which were very highly regarded in Angola. Something that I haven't researched myself, but there's kind of some information out there about these who went to Angola as well. The reality of exile, though, also was about the length of exile, so prolonged experience. Um, so for many who had expe expected it to be short, it took far longer, um, or it lasted far longer than, um, than expected. Um, two years after arriving on the island and working on a farm in the countryside, engaged in trying to revolutionize dairy production, Isolina Lincolau, uh, recalled she faced the decision of what to do long term and she said at first we all thought that our life in exile would be temporary brief that we were going to come back fast that's why we went to Argentina thinking we could come back fast and the plan failed in Cuba we also thought it was going to be brief that we were going to prepare become better leaders and from there nothing so we started to put our feet on the ground and admit that this was long and asked what should I do what should I do in many cases, then it was a question of how to build a revolutionary life in Cuba. And I'm conscious I've been speaking for quite a while, Chad Vigo, so I'm going to try and wrap up so that we have time for questions. But um, essentially, those who I've spoken to have told me at length, really, about the lives they built um, in Cuba, but also the revolutionary um, aspects of quotidian everyday life that they or the way in which they encountered this as being a revolutionary type of existence in everyday um, life. Um, many adapted and adjusted to work and study, and they've spoken about Cuba's opportun the opportunities Cuba offered to train as doctors, accountants, managers, nurses, teachers, construction workers, to study maths, music, poetry, psychology, architecture. They've talked to me about participating in local community neighborhood organizations, the famous CDRs in Cuba, the Committees for the Defense of the Revolution, and also of the voluntary work. And this is the picture on the left in your screen. Um, trabajo voluntario was nothing really voluntary in the way we might understand the word voluntarily. Um, it was expected and it was required, but it was also a means of social integration, of sociability, and families participated together. Children were also involved and involved in their own campaigns. Um, 
They've also talked to, about childcare and about what it was like to raise families um, on the island. And perhaps I can talk a little bit more about that in Q&A, but um, the picture on the right depicts, um, I, I, I mean, it's a, they're preparing for a show, but it's at the Escuela de Solidaridad con Chile, uh, which was a boarding school that Fidel Castro inaugurated in 1974 in Miramar, um, Havana, a formerly upper class district, um, which for many uh, Chilean exiles became home, um, a home from home, and where many of them spent the great majority of their time from Monday to Friday um, at this um, school. Um, looking back, I've been asking, you know, how do people remember exile? And, and this is the memory part um, of this project. Um, Memory wars relating to the Cold War era are alive and powerful throughout Latin America, and Cuba stands right at the center of that. And these memory battles over Cuba have had a large impact on what people have told me, but also the silences um, that have also been included, I think, in the um, um, testimonies that they've given me. So there has been perhaps silences regarding armed training and militancy that um, it was there, but they don't really want to recall it. Um, there's a reluctance to criticize Cuba for fear of repercussions, both from the right and from the left, actually. Um, but there's also been a desire to put Cuba's solidarity on the record. And that's something that's really motivated people to come forward and talk about this. And in that regard, um, I've been really struck and surprised by uh, how people remember this exile and how it really contrasts to the expectations of revolutionary training and military training that people had had. One of these, the main things that people talk to me again and again was a particular type of solidarity they encountered in Cuba. Um, the Cuban people's solidarity and generosity was, um, and here we've got, a, we've got some quotes here. I won't read them all, but here on the bottom right, the most beautiful experience that I've ever had in my life. Cuban solidarity is something I have never encountered again. Family solidarity, solidarity to the people that lived in the block from my work. Solidarity and affection was very important. On the left here, Isolina again is um, uh, speaking. Um, I, I just at the bottom of the quote say, for me, and the most significant thing about exile, especially now that I live in Chile and see how Chileans treat immigrants, is how the Cuban people treated us. Enrique talked about solidarity, solidarity, and permanent solidarity. Um, a second big finding was that the the significance of the work that people did for in Cuba and the sense of pride that people have had. Um, with uh, if, uh, the work that they did. So this is Fernando remembering a time of hard work, a lot of learning, a lot of comradeship, um, a lot of fraternity, a lot of suffering. Um, he says, uh, well, maybe I'll just pause and let you read, <laughs> read it yourself. Um, He ends what with the opportunity. What would you what do you want to do? What do you want to work and what would you like to study? And finally, I just finish with Olga. Um, and this is the last quote here. It's the third really kind of memory, which is a mixed experience, but a lived one, remembered in relation both to major personal experiences and political experiences as well, and how that experience in Cuba came together for her. She said, for me, Cuba was very big in my life. To see that revolution triumphant, it was impressive as everyone had the same thing. It was one thing that impacted us. Well, I came from a very, very poor family. So to get there and to see that everyone had more or less the same thing, it was exciting. I never thought about living in Cuba. I never thought about living that experience. I think I adapted very well, although there were comrades who did not adapt. Very importantly, I think I grew up as a person and well, having children there was an experience that I will always value. For me, it was fundamental that Cuba gave me life. I never thought about living that story that I lived the best I could with comradeship, compañerismo, with help, with solidarity. And I also received it. Exile in Cuba was good with its low points that we all had, sadness, anguish. And suddenly the Cubans were on one side and you were on the other. But we were in a country that was welcoming to us. And I should have said she was one of the those in the colonies at Tupamaro who ended up on the other side of the island. Um, but let me finish there with Olga quote um, and thank you just very much for listening these are initial sketches and thoughts about a new project so I appreciate your time and yeah live for listening okay thank you so much um lot of stimulating information I have lots of comments and questions but I should probably not be the first one who monopolizes the floor here 
and um, and let people share reactions, ask questions. Perhaps we move to Danielle first. Um, you put something in the um, chat, but maybe you want to speak out and ask your question. Yeah, I'd be happy to. Um, good afternoon, Dr. Harmer. It is so wonderful to hear about your new project and your research. I am a huge fan of your work, so I'm a little uh, starstruck right now. Um, oh, <laughs> I have two questions for you. Um, what You talked about inter-Cuban solidarity. Um, I'm interested in how the exile communities communicated with other exile communities and solid solidarity networks around the world. Um, that's one question. And then the second is you mentioned that a lot of the exile populations were in the 17 to 30 range. Um, and I study Cold War Chilean University student activism. So I'm very interested in if and how exiles pursued university education while in Cuba and how they then may have connected. I know that might not be relevant to the full scope of your work, but I'm just curious about if and how they may have studied. Um, yeah, oh, but thank you. And thank you so much um, for the question. So in terms of communication, they relied on people traveling um, to get the messages out, right? So um, postal services from Cuba were not great, but they relied on um, people traveling actually between embassies as well. So where there was the Cuban embassy, you could, you could send things through diplomatic pouch from embassy to embassy um, and uh, travel um, as well. Um, and, and, and that travel is, was paid for as well by the Cuban state or by the, the hosts of those um, uh, um, exiles elsewhere. So I think that's important to know as well as solidarity funds, but most of the solidarity funds tended to be channeled back into Chile. So um, they weren't spent on kind of planes and, and um, you know, travel. So um, I, I've, I've managed through my work on Beatriz, I, I, I read a lot of letters, um, you know, um, essentially, you know, typed letters um, rather than kind of telex or any kind of th those kind of um, kinds of communication. Um, in terms of university education, I mean, I think when I was saying 17 to 30, it's really just about the population of those in the colonies. So um, actually in the exiles, you do have older, younger, you know, in, in kind of exiles communities across uh, Cuba and, and Chileans, and particularly with the Uruguayan Communist Party members as well, you have older exiles as well. But um, university education was provided free and um, very openly to anybody who wanted it, um, who arrived. And actually, um, it seemed easier to kind of place people within university courses than perhaps to offer them um, work where they, you know, unless they were trained in very specific professions like doctors or, or nurses. Um, they, um, from what I understand, you know, and those who went to university had the most incredible time in the 70s and 80s at university in Cuba. I mean, they re regard it and re recall it very fondly and nostalgically in many respects. Um, you know, being in your late teens, 20s in Cuba in the 70s and 80s, particularly the 80s, I mean, they talk about this was the años de gloria of Cuba. This was the, these were the golden years of the Cuban revolution. So um, social events, learning, um, very often um, Latin American kind of groups formed. So they talked about other groups. So Angolans, Vietnamese, um, people from all over different parts of the world. And I'd say, but, and so who did you hang out with? And it tended to be the other kind of Latin Americans or and exiles and Cubans as well. But there was a very famous Latin American brigade that was formed um, that went out in the summer to do voluntary work in different parts of the island. So um, it was, Yes, the very plen there was a lot of opportunity to study. Um, um, I think probably I'll stop there, but um, yeah, I, I'd love to talk more about it. And I, hopefully I'll be able to kind of expand on it in the project. Um. Fantastic. Thank you, great. I will um, move over to Liz. Liz had her hand up next and then James. Liz, the floor is yours. Um, okay, thank you uh, very much for this important and uh, really interesting uh, research. So I was interested in what you were saying about how exiles in Cuba were able to um, maintain and cultivate a revolutionary imaginary and, and also the party politics. And so my question is, um, what was the, the long-term um, impact of that? Um, for example, when exiles returned to Chile, and I'm thinking, you know, comparatively, say, vis-a-vis -vis exiles who were other places like in Europe who returned to Chile. So 
um, do you see a, a you know what 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 difference did did it make in people's longer term trajectory having been in exile in Cuba? If you've seen anything like that. Um, thank you very much for the question, and that's something that I didn't talk about, but it is a, it's been a big part of the project so far, partly because I've been interviewing a lot of second generation, what well, it's hard to kind of put the name second generation exiles or children of exiles. Um, it meant a lot to come from Cuba, it meant something very different to come from Cuba than elsewhere. Um, uh, particularly because of the type of context in which they were arriving back. Um, so the pactage democracies, these very constrained ideas of what democratization process would entail, meant that there was a lot of fear of the right that still existed, a fear of that kind of what you could say, what you couldn't say about where you'd been, fear about families. Um, one uh, interviewee wanted to be anonymous because month part of her family still doesn't know to this day that she was in Cuba in exile, um, but also um, constrained by um, those who inherited the democratic transition, perhaps more on the center left, who found the Cuban experience awkward to the narrative and, and, the, and what where to go. So um, for the children particularly, it was, extremely traumatic and um it's it's actually many of the interviews they've they've been reliving you know that trauma of having to lose their accents very quickly of um um find, suddenly finding the paradise on earth that they've been led to believe existed in cuba was was not accepted or celebrated elsewhere um they talk about um it's very different schools, very at different attitudes to gender in some cases. Um, but also the other, the adults found, you know, integration into work very difficult. And the one of the questions was whether the university degrees would be um, recognized or not recognized um, became a, a, a big problem. But for those who were who were professionals who were able to then work, um, uh, it was much easier. But um, Many talked of precarity um, economically, of um, being finding it very hard to live, kind of financially, um, um, in the early years of returning of the, in this neoliberal kind of um, democratic um, transition, um, and and very much of, of being quiet. So, in the Uruguayans I spoke to said we we just didn't talk about Cuba. We we were just silent about it. And it was only when Mujica was elected and there was a turn, change in government in Uruguay that people felt able to start reconnecting. And I think the pandemic has also changed things for two reasons. One, um, or pre-pandemic as well, that the social media revolution in Cuba has meant that many of them are now able to communicate with friends back in Cuba that they haven't spoken to and that they basically had to leave and were disconnected from for 20 years. Um, and so this, or yeah, and there's been, or 30 years, there's been a reconnection with the island, um, which has meant that they've started speaking about it more, but it was, it was difficult. It's, yeah, it was very different. Thank you. I'd like to fold in a quick question that, that directly ties to Liz's question, and that is the the characteristics of the Chilean exiles and the Tupamaros um, who went to Cuba, who had a starkly different position than the Unidad Popular, um, especially in reference to violence. Did that not make a big difference and play a giant role also of, of how they spoke about their period there, how they related to Cuba? They were not on the same line all the time. So, yeah. I think for the Tupamaros, it, it changes slightly because the, the organization splits and then it disbands. And then it, it, I mean, it really collapses to a large extent in the mid 70s. And then you have in, an inheritor kind of party that takes over. So um, there's a lot of shifts in the revolutionary kind of formal political identity. For the Mir, um, uh, I mean, they 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 were priv they were privileged in Cuba. I mean, they get the own apartments, they get the special training, they get you know they were fated and um, 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 and so those that I've spoken to who returned, I mean, talk about about the trauma of reencountering. But at least one of them also uh, clashed with the Mir and with the Cuba during the eighties, and so changed 
changed her opinion of her youthful revolutionary self um, and um, actually started questioning um, a lot about um, previous assumptions, um, partly to do with the way in which life was kind of contained and constrained within Cuba. And I, I've talked about kind of reality versus expectations. Cuba was very hospitable and welcoming and it had all this solidarity, but autonomy wasn't necessarily within that solidarity. Um, the, the autonomy to challenge, to question. Um, and for those who did, um, you know, they, they also experienced not only a kind of transformation of exile, but also a kind of political kind of rethinking of previous projects, if that makes sense. So, yes, absolutely. Yeah. It does. It does. I have more follow-up questions, but I'll hand over to James now and I'll speak to you later about this. Thank you for the answer. Yeah. Uh, thank you again for this talk today, uh, Dr. Harmer. I just want to echo my wife that I'm a very huge fan <laughs> of your work. Uh, ever since I first read it in yeah, one of Yadvika's graduate courses. Um, I have uh, two questions, but they're very brief. It's not a long, oh, here's a paragraph of two questions. First, um, do you have people who told you that they went to um, Cuba specifically because they felt they had to, as it would be the only place maybe that something like Operation Condor could not get to them as they could get to them in Europe, they could get to them in other South America countries or in DC, as we've seen. Um, and then the second question that ties into what um, Yadvika and Dr. Oglesby were asking you, has anyone um, that you interviewed sort of given the idea that this wasn't quite the Cuba of like Che Guevara that they had hoped to come to that's being leaned on a little more now in the seventies by the Soviet Union. The PSP has been rehabilitated who did not you know, participate in the revolution and that they had this idea of the sixties the Cuba that they didn't quite get um, by the time of like the reality of the seventies is occurring. Um, yeah, no, those are both very um, um, good, very, very good questions. Um, um, I think to the first, yes, I think there were people who thought this was the only place that they'd be safe. I mean, I can't, I mean, I, this is at the beginning of a project. I mean, I think it depends on the leaders as well. Um, um, you know, there were certain leaders who had to be either in Eastern Europe or in Cuba um, for their own safety. Um, um, I, I mean, I, I spoke to one woman who was in Italy who was instructed by her, the Mir to go to Cuba, that the Cuba was the only place that these widows and families would be safe and that the Cubans would protect these families and they had to go. Um, she didn't question it. Um, she didn't, you didn't, you know, there were loyalty to the party was um, um, full, but um, there was certainly this sense that, you know, this was somewhere that was safe. That was the, you, you could really trust in, in, in the Cuban um, kind of security to protect them from, from Operation Condor or for the United States. Um, in terms of not the Cuban that they had kind of imagined or dreamed of, I think that was a realization for many, um, I think, um, particularly, but it was not necessarily versus um, kind of imaginings from the 60s, it was also, um, you know, gradual kind of reality of day to day living and and problems and ration books and um, buses and queues because Alamar was this base of this exile community. It took two hours to get to Havana um, for, to study and two hours back on buses that you had to wait for that sometimes didn't turn up. And so these constraints, although you know, explained by the blockade in, in, in their minds was also kind of the realities of living in this socialist world, this socialist revolutionary island were difficult. Um, there were I, one of the parts of the project that I'm really interested in is gender and family. So um, that question of arriving in the island and finding that you know they hadn't resolved the question of gender or um, um, machismo and um, was something that a lot of people talk to me about, um, um, saying you know um, realizing that revolutions don't happen overnight. Um, I think it was Isolina told me but they take a long time. And we arrived, you know, she said, we arrived, you know, 20 years in and 15 years, 10 years, they hadn't, this was still something that they'd only just started to start, think about. And many would argue that was never really resolved by the revolution, the question of gender um, specifically. So I would yeah. argue that, I would argue that. Thank you so much. I, let's do a last, last question, handing over to Olivia, um, please. Um, 
Hi, thank you. Thank you for your presentation, Dr. Harmer. I'm a current master's student here at the University of Arizona, and I'm planning on doing a geographic concentration in the Southern Cone, particularly surrounding the historical period of the dictatorship. So I found your presentation very interesting. And um, my question is, you mentioned, um, I believe it was particularly the Uruguayans in particular who were originally hesitant to identify as exiles when they first arrived in Cuba, but that um, they thought of their time in Cuba as something more temporary. But then as time went on, they began to realize that this was something much more long-term and um, in contrast to what they originally thought about arriving in Argentina. Have you noticed uh, a shift in the way that they have remembered their experience in Cuba, either positively or negatively, based on this type of identification or how their perceptions as their timelines in Cuba have changed? Yeah, so I think that shift from that transitory period, and thank you so much for your question, that um, to um, to the end of the colonies and the decision to stay on the island and integrate as Como un cubano más is the way they explained it. So like any other Cuban um, was, a, was, was an automatic one for some people, but was incredibly difficult. And actually one of the quotes I didn't bring into time, but was, was regarding this decision to stay being very, very difficult. And one of them said that he got to his new apartment fully furnished in Santiago, I think it was. Um, and him and his wife or his partner cried all night, um, having been on the island for three years before. And 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 I, why did you cry all night? He said, because that's when exile started. Before then, this was seventy six. They'd been there. He said because that was when exile really began for them. And so that shift from um, we're here on route back home to okay, now we we resume, we get our identities back. So they got their own names, they got a pass, you know, not passports, but they got their names, identities back. But that was also an acknowledgement that that was permanent, um, or at least it was long-term. Um, so that I think they talk about is actually a very difficult transition. Um, but also, other, and, uh, you know, others have talked about it as a moment where their political identities stopped. So one of them said there's time for guerrillar which like to to make war or to go to fight um, y tiempo para crear so this was a moment where many decided to start families um, and to settle down and so many of those who were distributed actually began to kind of start to work out what kind of lives they wanted on a personal level rather than just kind of on a political level thank you so much Thank you. Thank you for everybody's questions. Um, thanks uh, for everybody's attendance and for a great talk, Tanya. I'm so sorry that we are running out of time. Yeah, um, yeah, it's my fault. <laughs> no, uh, it is uh, not a fault. Well, it's the fault of time itself, I guess. But um, so um, thanks again. And um, I hope um, that we'll have uh, the great pleasure of seeing some published work in the near future. Um, and um, I'm looking forward to uh, keeping a conversation going on these important subjects. Um,